had sat in the circle like one of them. I can't remember what we were doing, but I remember the teacher had broken us into groups for some activity. The other kids sat around the circle, talking and laughing and working together. I sat there with them, silent and watching. I don't think I was really there. In those days, no matter where I was, I wasn't really there. I was the best reader in the class. Boxes lined the shelves under the classroom's windows, each labeled with the reading level of the books within. I was the only one reading from the box furthest to the right, where the books reached into the hundreds of pages. I sat alone most breaks, reading those books, getting lost in their worlds. I took them home and let them take me away to fantastical places, away from my life. I needed them at home the most. I can only remember one of the books I read that year, of all the ones piled in the boxes. It was called Back to Front Benji, and it told the story of a young boy whose parents met doing something they both loved, facing backwards while traveling on trains. Out of their shared love, Benji was born, and took that love further by doing everything backwards. He walked backwards, talked backwards. At school, the other kids started copying him, so he was kicked out. In the end, Benji gets struck by lightning, and, to his parents' relief, starts doing everything forwards. He finally fits in and can live a normal life. I sat in that circle, the voices and noises of my classmates rising to a crescendo until I could sit in silent peace no longer. They were just kids, laughing and having fun. But all I heard were the loud booms and cracks of thunder. In my head, lightning flashed, hot and blinding. I closed my eyes and tried to hold it all in, my face growing redder and redder as the blaze inside me grew. My body started shaking. Noises escaped my mouth, alien and frightening. Guys, guys! Stop! He's getting angry! I opened my eyes to find that though I still sat on the outside of the circle, I was now the center of attention. The other kids stared at me, some afraid, some concerned. Others snickered behind their hands. One or two made no attempt to hide their amusement. I forced a smile to my lips, reassured them with my eyes and brow that I was okay. The weird, crazy kid was okay. After what seemed an age, they forgot about me again and went back to what they were doing. I wish the lightning had struck everyone except Benji his parents couldn't accept him, though he was doing what they had loved first, what had brought them together. His life was an extension of their love. He wasn't hurting anybody. He was just too different. I've never been much for morning routines, or mornings at all. All through high school, I got in trouble for falling asleep in morning classes. I felt more alive at night. The world becomes silent. People go to sleep and I can finally be alone. I can do what I want. Be myself under cover of darkness and dreams. 
When I decided to start writing, I found surprisingly that I worked best before night. If I didn't wake up early, have a quick breakfast and coffee, then isolate myself in the shed out back, where the Wi-Fi couldn't reach me, and make myself write until lunch, if I didn't follow this little morning routine, I would not write that day. That day would be hazy and lethargic, coating my imagination in honey and syrup, to stun and be stunned like a creature suspended. Those days were of a kind I was only too familiar with. However, if I wrote in the morning, it didn't matter what I did in the afternoon, my mind stayed clear. Pain, anger, fear, all were left in that dusty, cluttered shed, ready to be picked up the next morning, but sparing me till then. In that shed, Day by day, I poured out my fancies until they stretched over tens of thousands of words, hundreds of pages, a novel. I showed it to a few people, told me more I finally completed it, but I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. Soon I realized why. Though parts of the story were mine, many more were pure fantasy. I tried to tell a real story, but it was not my story to tell. I could hear the responses. They're doing exactly what they tell others not to do. Hypocrites. And I agreed. I was a hypocrite. So I buried my first novel, not literally in the ground, but hidden in my hard drive. I stopped spending mornings in the shed. My mind sank into business depths and stopped I stayed shut in my room, returning to my nighttime habits. The moon bore witness to my self-flagellation. Of course, the novel was but a piece of a larger, distressing puzzle. It took me a long time to put it all together to realize that I could not continue in the way I was. I needed to build a life of love, courage and pride. I couldn't do that where I was, under a form of house arrest, free only in the brief, deep hours after midnight. So I left. I moved far away, searching for what I always had, a home. But before I left, I scratched a message in a hidden corner of that shed, hoping someone would find it one day and feel the magic that once existed in that place. It read, Here I sat alone and stared at a blank page until my eyes watered. I drank from those cataracts until my vision cleared. Then, I wrote.
when I was home or out with friends though, I wouldn't drink, I wouldn't smoke. To them all, I seemed a rare breed of bartender, avoiding intoxication like the plague. I wouldn't have a glass of wine with dinner, even if everyone else was. Everyone praised me for it. All I felt was shame. I hid my sickly self so well I sometimes believed my own lie. Yet, every time that glass was offered, I felt the stab of temptation. One especially hard day on the job, I guess some of my co-workers couldn't stand to wait until after work. I noticed them regularly swapping floor shifts, leaving the bar to walk around collecting glasses and plates to take to the back. They'd stay in there a bit longer than usual, then come back to the bar suddenly more cheerful. When I took a bathroom break, I passed through to see what was happening. No one was in the back, but I could see a half-empty bottle of vodka, barely hidden behind the napkins and wine coolers. I hadn't been invited to join. Maybe that's what first started me stealing sips, topping it up with water like a teenager. Several hours and many sips of the bottle later, I started to notice my co-workers' furtive glances and whispered discussions. I don't know exactly what their concern was. Maybe they were worried about me. More likely, they were worried I'd blow their cover. The first glass I dropped was almost euphoric. The whole bar whooped and hollered as they always did when a glass broke. We laughed together and the customers and staff alike patted me on the back. The second and third glass, though, shattered loudly and silenced the room. The looks were no longer furtive. I ran to the bathroom just so I could hide my face. My reflection in the mirror was blurred from my vision or the old glass, I don't know. When I came out, my boss was waiting. He led me into his office, past my watching co-workers. There they go. I could hear their thoughts. Won't be seeing them again. They were right. The bottle of vodka stood on my boss's desk. The firing was calm and curt. If anything, my boss looked more tired than annoyed. I left without retrieving my belongings from the staff room. I ran past everyone, tears in my eyes, shaking from head to toe. They must have thought I was distraught. I kept running until I reached a nearby park. Throwing myself down behind a bush, I wept and wept until my eyes stung. Passers-by gave me a wide berth. None were ready for what came next, though. Tears still wet on my face, I began to laugh, and kept laughing until I was cackling and rolling and clutching my chest, fresh tears spewing from my eyes. After it all, I lay there staring at the sky, a stupid grin on my face. Someone had finally noticed. The mailbox is full and cannot accept any messages at this time. Goodbye. Many 
extent that they are forgotten. Most of their inhabitants are from times long gone. Their families and friends are either dead themselves, or they and their descendants have moved somewhere else. Some graves, though, house the people of the past who have lived and died alone. Not everyone has loved ones in life or in death. It can be hard to tell which graves hold these life and death long loners. After all, one gravestone looks very much like another, and their contents are buried mysteries. However, I found one or two I think are clear enough. They bear no words of remembrance, no statement that the deceased is missed by their spouse or children. The grass over the grave is kept neat and short like all the others, but if you inspect it close enough, you can tell it has never been flattened by either offerings or ornament. The well-trodden paths weaving between the plots pass them by without pause. I like to sit close to these graves, but not too close. I don't want to disturb their pristine, untouched nature. Back against a better visited headstone, I stare at the names of yesteryear's lonely souls. I know nothing about them or their lives, but I understand them perfectly. Their spirits wrap around me in a soothing blanket of peace and rest. Whatever hardships they have faced are long forgotten. Now they have only an eternity of nothing before them. Silent, cozy, nothing. They will never know how much they mean to me. They will never know anything about this person who visits them so often. They will never know. But I will. And I know. One day. Someone will do the same for me. Hush, little baby, don't say a word Mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird And if that mockingbird won't sing Mama's gonna buy you a diamond ring